Good morning. What a blessing to be together. Glad you could be here today to worship the Lord, and thanks for joining online if you are. Now, our call to worship comes from Jude, beginning in verse 24. This is a word of worship, a word of praise, and it begins this way. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through our Lord Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray to you. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray to you. And Holy Spirit, we pray by your power and we pray to you as well. We worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory, for your majesty, for your authority, for your power. We thank you and we come to worship you now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand as we sing to the Lord together this morning. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. He came to save His glories now we sing Who died and rose on high Who died eternal life to bring And lives that death may die Crown Him the Lord of heaven One with the Father When 
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory. I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. You may be seated. God, it's for you. He heard a phone ring. If you don't know why, Donnie just called out in the middle of the service. <laughs> Thank you, Donnie. I appreciate that. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter 1, where our scripture reading will come from. Uh, let me say thank you for the faithful givers. You, you know, we've put our offering plate in the back, and thank you for noticing that and teaching your children that and many are giving online we're thankful for that but through these two years of doing things a little differently that has been a blessing to see the faithful giving of our members thank you for that john chapter one beginning in verse 19 we look today in the message at the testimony of john the baptist and that's how John the Apostle begins this passage. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you, so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why are you baptizing, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin." This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, I pray that you would help us to understand the 
the depth of this passage and what it teaches us of the mission of John, but of Christ our Savior, what it teaches us about the necessity of salvation in Him alone. Father, I thank you for mission work going on around the country and Canada and around the world through the Southern Baptist Convention, through the International Mission Board and the North American <coughs> Mission Board. And I, Father, we, we do pray for those who work in the legal system, giving voice to the unborn. We pray you would bless them. We thank you for the Ethics and Religious Commission Religious Liberty Commission of our denomination and we pray for your blessing upon them as they give arguments and write treatises and so forth for the unborn and to try to sway legislation. We pray, Father, for, for good effect in the coming year. We pray for more and more realization among just honest thinking people of what is in the womb, that it is a human life even further than that, a human life that you have given, we pray people would come to that conclusion. We lift up the sick among us, particularly pray for those who have had COVID, those who are going through it. We pray, Father, that they would get through it safely by your grace and mercy. And we pray for uh, an ending of this pandemic around the world, that, uh, that doors would be open for greater ministry in churches, but also uh, greater avenues on the mission fields. We pray. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you here. Thank you for those who have come, those who are watching online. Father, bless our worship of you. Help our, our hearts to be sincere, our words to be true. Bless the preaching of your word in just a bit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to sing the Lord together. <laughs> Like the Lord our God. 
president or a president of the United States ever planned a speech in downtown Jarrettsville, uh, do you think that most of us would be aware of the fact that he was coming? Yes. Yeah, we would be. TV, news, uh, radio, uh, papers, social media uh, would, would be giving a press release. Um, you know, here in Hartford County, we, we would receive a message from Rick Ayers, if he's still doing it, telling us about the emergency operation of the day. In first century Palestine, the days of Christ, there was no such news media as that. If a king in those days were to visit a town, a city, he might send ahead what was known as a herald in order to get the attention of the people, to announce the approach of the king, to focus the people's attention on the king, and then the herald would recede into the background, having done his job. God had predetermined that Jesus, as the Messiah, as king of Israel, in the line of David, would have a herald. John the Baptist. And his preaching marks the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Just as God used John the Baptist to testify of Jesus as the Messiah, may he use this morning our study of John and his testimony to awaken, to revive, to turn hearts to God's will and to God's Son our only hope of salvation from sin. I mean, let this passage say that to you. There is no other way. That's why missions is essential, that God be honored and glorified and that people understand their sin. There is no other hope of salvation. And if you're here this morning without Christ, let John's words and our study of them show you there is no other hope from salvation, of salvation from sin other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John the Baptist is introduced to us in the prologue, prologue that we looked at last week. So in John 1, look at verse 6. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And then down in verse 15, John the Apostle writes of him, John also, or John testified about him and, and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, 
He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, where he existed before me. He is introduced in our passage as a witness, as one who testified about Jesus' importance and Jesus' superiority. First in our passage, we see John's witness, John's testimony as to himself, who he was, verses 19 through 28. And John shows an understanding, just notice this, of his place in God's plan. He shows a contentment and a commitment to the role that God has given to him. Verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews, in verse 24, they're identified as the Pharisees, when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now, the religious leaders rightly wanted to know what was going on. Who was this man, John the Baptist, who was asking Jews to be baptized? Now think about that. Gentiles converting to Judaism, they understood baptism there. It was an outward show of their commitment now to the Jewish faith. But John was asking all men to repent and confess sins. And so they sent a delegation of those who ministered the religious life of Israel at the temple, priests and Levites, to go and question John. And they were sent with a specific question, verse 19, who are you? Now, sensing that they were wondering if he were God's promised Messiah that had been prophesied hundreds of years before, John the Baptist emphatically replies in verse 20, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So that's why I say emphatically, just the way this verse is written, he is making sure they understand he is not the Messiah, the one looked toward as the promised Savior King. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Where did that come from? Well, their question is based on the prophecy in Malachi. Malachi 4, 5 says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. The religious leaders of Israel thought that Elijah, who had never died a physical death, remember he went up into heaven in the chariot and the whirlwind, that he was going to return in the flesh. We have in Luke chapter 1, the angel's testimony to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, listen to it. Because the father hears this word about his son. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. So that prophecy is given and fulfilled in John the Baptist. But John knew that he was not Elijah in the flesh returned to earth, and he says in verse 21, I am not. They ask the next question, are you the prophet? Again, another prophecy is in mind. They were thinking of Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, where it says, the Lord your God will raise up for you, Israel, a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Well, John the Baptist it seems to have understood that this prophecy found ultimate fulfillment in the Messiah, in Christ, not in his ministry, verse 21, and he answered, no. Then they said to him, well, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? What is your authority, in other words, for, for what you're doing? Is there any authority? Well, yes, there was. John the Baptist said, verse 23, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. 
that makes straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now, in most English versions, you'll have something that sets aside that as a quote of Isaiah. So John answers with the authority of the scripture, and he understands who he is fulfilling this prophecy. His, his answer is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And in that chapter, Isaiah is looking to and prophesying a, a future return of Israel from exile, something that in John the Baptist day had already taken place. He was prophesying a symbolic picture of the approach of God for the purpose of leading the Jews in joyful return to their homeland after the years of captivity. Well, in John the Baptist day, we can say, and in our day, of course, the exile had taken place. The people had returned. The temple was rebuilt. The wall of Jerusalem rebuilt. And that was all glorious. But when we come to this passage, we have to say, and John understands, that was not the fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy. And each gospel writer points that out. God's visit using the same Isaiah 43 passage, that God's visitation, God's coming was fulfilled in the coming of his son, Jesus. That's the ultimate fulfillment. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, by God's inspiration, apply Isaiah 40, verse 3, to John the Baptist. Why did God want them to do that? Because John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness. And because the people needed to make ready the way of the Lord, who was now very near, Jesus, who is called Christ the Lord in Luke 2.11 by the angel. So just notice a voice, a straight way, make ready the way of the Lord, Isaiah 40, verse 3. And because the deliverance of Israel from captivity was a, a picture, we call it a type of the more important, far more glorious deliverance of all those who would receive Jesus as their deliverer from sin. That's what's going on here. Yes, it was fulfilled in previous days in history, but this is why God had Isaiah write it. This is why God had Isaiah proclaim it as a prophecy of John the Baptist being the voice of the Lord in Isaiah 43 being the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when a king was traveling and approaching a city, his way would be smooth, physical objects would be taken out of the way, removed. The calling of John the Baptist, as he understood it, was to make a smooth, straight way for Jesus, the coming king. How was he to do that? Well, it wasn't preparation of a physical pathway. It was the preparation of people's hearts. By understanding their sin, the people would be able to understand their need of salvation. And not salvation from the power of another nation, as so many thought in that day, that that's what the Messiah would accomplish, a great Jewish revival of national proportion. So not that, but salvation from the power and penalty of sin against God. By God's doing, John understood who he was in God's plan. He was a voice that would announce, that would herald the arrival of the Messiah. He was a voice that would get the attention of the people and prepare the way of the Lord. Listen, through a message of repentance, of recognizing, of understanding, admitting, confessing, Repenting of sin, being sorrowful for it. The only way to receive the King Jesus was and is today to repent of sin. Without an understanding of sin, you don't understand your need of a Savior. Verse 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. I mentioned that earlier. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing? If you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. 
Again, what is the purpose of your ministry and by what authority are you doing this? Are you baptized? John answered and said, them saying, I baptize in water. So obviously we are to understand an, an outward sign, just a physical action of baptizing in water. Baptism means to immerse, so people going down into the water we would understand. An outward sign though of an inward reality that repentance had taken place. In the other gospels we get that clearly. It wasn't just come in the water, everyone. No, it was have you repented of your sins? Have you understood them and repented of them? So John answered, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Notice what John is doing. He's taking the attention off of himself. That's enough questions about me. Let me tell you about this other one. See, I'm just gathering an audience. I'm preparing hearts for one much greater than me. The emphasis of Jesus' greatness compared to John's needs to be understood by us when he says, I'm not worthy even to take off his sandals. The idea there is to wash his feet. He is saying, I am lower than the lowest servant next to him. It, it, it was said culturally, you wouldn't ask your slave to do that. And John is saying, I'm not worthy of doing it. So what's going on in verses 26 and 27 is John saying he is the one you should be asking about. He stands among us now. He has come forth to begin his ministry. What I'm doing is pointing to him. So don't be preoccupied with me. Look to Jesus. Verse 28. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptized, baptizing. Bethany was just a few miles east of Jerusalem. So John is not in some really out of the way place. He's not hiding. He was announcing the coming of the Lord promised in scripture and baptizing those who repented of their sin. Listen, let me just say it now. We have a similar ministry. We announce Jesus first coming and that he's coming again. And we baptize those who repent and believe in him. And we make much of him and little of ourselves as we do that. John's bab John the Baptist's testimony then as to Jesus. Let's turn there. Verse 29 takes us there. The next day, I take that as the day after his encounter with the priests and the Levites. He saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, there was a day coming, some three years from this day, <clears throat> when walking into the city of Jerusalem, the crowd of people accompanying Jesus would be crying out together, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. The time was the Feast of Passover, which celebrated God's deliverance of the nation of Israel from the slavery to Egypt. And the people that day were excited. Palm Sunday, we call it. They were full of anticip anticipation, praising Jesus who had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And they were expecting him to begin his reign as king of Israel and save them from the rule of the Romans. But Jesus, on that day, knew he was not walking into Jerusalem to rule. He was walking into Jerusalem to die. There would be salvation, not of a political nature, but rather of a personal nature. Because through his death on the cross, there would be forgiveness of personal sin against God. So here, at the beginning of John's gospel, we find Jesus walking alone. He's returning from his time of facing Satan's temptation in the wilderness. And if you recall, Satan tempting him to fulfill ministry in different ways, ways other than God's will. He approaches the place called Bethany where John the Baptist is baptizing. 
It says in verse 29, he saw, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want you to note, I want you to underline in your Bible if you do that, but in your mind, in your heart, that John, the prophet of God, the prophesied prophet of God, the voice introduces Jesus not as a conquering king, but as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I don't know of anything more important than to know the identity and understand the ministry of Jesus. Who was he? We've learned in John's gospel last week, he is the eternal son of God who became flesh, a man. The God-man through human birth. Why did he come? John the Baptist tells us. Jesus came to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus was the Lamb of God? Two biblical pictures help us to understand. One of them is Passover. A Jewish celebration. The celebration was not far away from the time that we have here in John chapter 1. Passover celebrated the Jews' deliverance from Egypt when they were enslaved there, their deliverance by God. On Passover, it was the blood of a lamb which protected the houses of the Israelites on the night that they left Israel. On that night, the angel of death took the life of the firstborn of every household which ended up being the Egyptians' household because they had no blood on their doorposts. The Israelites were instructed to put that blood, the blood of an unblemished male lamb, on their doorposts. And the angel, seeing the blood, would pass over that house. So the name, Passover. The blood of the lamb would deliver them from <clears throat> the death of their firstborn. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, that Christ is, you might remember, our Passover. He shed his blood that we, through faith in what he did, might cover our sinful lives in that blood, that in the time of judgment we may escape eternal death. That's one picture, the Passover, as to why and understanding phrase, Lamb of God. The second picture is simply the temple sacrifices. John the Baptist was a son of Zechariah, who was a priest. John was familiar with the ritual of the temple, the daily sacrifices of the animals there. Every morning, every evening, a lamb was sacrificed on the altar for the sins of the people. It was to be a lamb without defect, without blemish. So when John said, behold, the Lamb of God. He was saying that Jesus was the Lamb God was providing and that his Jesus' death would take away the sin of the world. This is prophesied in Isaiah 53, 6 and 7. All of us like sheep have gone astray. That's a statement about the sinfulness of every person. Each of us has turned to his own way but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him in that passage, the servant, the Messiah, who we know as Jesus. He, Jesus, was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, listen, like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was declaring at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that Jesus' primary purpose in coming to earth was to be a sacrifice for sin. Would he show us God's character in the way he lived and spoke and taught? Of course. Of course. Would he teach us great things that we still learn from so that we know God's will? Yes, of course. 
But Jesus himself spoke of his primary purpose in saying that he would lay his life down. That he would be lifted up as the serpent was, a reference to his crucifixion. He understood who he was, and by God's inspiration of John the Baptist, John the Baptist understood him. That his primary purpose in coming to earth was to be a sacrifice for sin. That's the meaning of the title, Lamb of God. That through his shed blood on the cross, God might offer forgiveness. The taking away of the guilt and punishment of sin. If that doesn't mean anything to you, it should. You've not been a perfect person. We need forgiveness of holy God. We have any hope of heaven. God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Understand, he says that and we believe it. Jesus is the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. All that that was for Israel, it was especially pointing to the one who would come as the perfect lamb, the God-man lamb who could lay his life down. Just as a lamb had to be spotless, the lamb of God had to be spotless. The Savior had to be without sin. The Savior had to be God. Jesus' death on the cross would mean nothing if he were not God. The Apostle John in the prologue tells us that the word Jesus was God who became flesh. He then could be the perfect lamb. To whom is the offer made? Whose sin can be forgiven? We'll look at it again in verse 29. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now those there, the, 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 the priests and the Levites who were, well, they weren't there that day, but the people might have thought, he might have said, takes away the sin of my people, takes away the sin of the Jews. But the offer no is made to the world, not just the Jews, but people from every nation. And of course, you know, that's where the Great Commission leads us. That's where the images, the visions in the book of Revelation tell us that we're going toward every nation, every tribe being in heaven, people from every nation and every tribe. Well, John the Baptist continues testifying of Jesus' identity. Verse 30, this is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, John was born first in, you know, days of history, he was, but Jesus has existed eternally. We know that from chapter 1. And John will explain this further in, in, in verse 34. Right now, verse 31. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. In other words, he's saying, I don't know who the Messiah, I did not know who the Messiah was, but I knew that the purpose of my ministry was that he might be manifested, shown to Israel. And in order to manifest him, I baptized in water. A baptism of repentance. But baptism calls people to become public about their repentance. See, baptism is something that is teaching us also in this passage that God wants us to be public about our faith, about our devotion to him. I baptized in water, a baptism of repentance. Understand, all of us, the importance of repentance to faith in Jesus Unless you repent, unless you change your mind about sin, you are blind as to your need of a Savior. You are. You may, you may want to know him because you think much of him, but unless you understand your sin, you don't understand him as the Lamb of God. Verse 32. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. John doesn't include that uh, actual baptism of Jesus as the other gospel writers do. This is an example of him assuming that you've read, perhaps, Mark. I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, the Lord said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes 
in the Holy Spirit. God confirmed Jesus' identity with this sign. As I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all recorded. Notice the phrase, remaining on him regarding to the Holy Spirit. The Phar just interesting to me that the Pharisees would later accuse Jesus of exercising demons by demonic power. In other words, you, you, you cast out demons by Beelzebub, the Satan, the leader of demons. But John testifies at the outside, said right here, that Jesus lived his life in the power of the Holy Spirit that remained upon him. Doesn't mean he wasn't God in and of himself. He was, but the Spirit, we, we always see God working in unity, the Spirit working with him. John is saying in these verses, my baptism is a physical sign for those who repent of their sin, preparing them to come to Christ. His baptism, Jesus, is a work of the Holy Spirit, a spiritual transformation of those who believe in him. Now he's talking about something different than what we do. Well, we don't, can't see the baptistry. It's back there behind the screen. Something different than our water baptism. Our water baptism is a way of celebrating this spiritual baptism that takes place in a person's heart when they are born again through faith, through repentance. But he's saying Jesus' baptism is a spiritual transformation of those who believe. Verse 34 I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Notice he doesn't say Lamb of God again. He says Son of God. So John the Baptist's conclusion, Lamb of God equals Son of God. From our understanding of Scripture, we know it had to be this way. No one else but God was fit to be the Lamb of God. Because no one else is unblemished. We all have sin. We all are unholy. Only God could die for sin as an unblemished sacrifice. Only the eternal value of that sacrifice could pay the eternal punishment sin against God deserved. This, this is... Um, an understanding of these things makes you appreciate God's plan, even though some of it will still be mysterious. If we understand the depth of our sin and the greatness of God's holiness, we will know that no great person, great human being, could ever be a sacrifice for us. We could die to save someone else from physical death, perhaps. We could give our lives in a cause could not give our lives ever to free someone from the guilt of their sin. And God established that through the shedding of blood, sin would be forgiven. It had to be God the Son's blood. Jesus, who appeared as a man, was the Son of God who had come from heaven to be the Lamb of God. Amen. Implications. Well, we're with regard to your own heart, let me say, prepare the way for Jesus. How? Repent. Change your mind about sin. See it as, as God sees it and, and forsake it. If there are other things that are as important or more important than God, call them what God calls them. They are other gods in your life. If you have formed a view of God in your mind that you're comfortable with, that's not from scripture, call it what God call, calls it, idolatry, and taking his name in vain. If you speak about God without reverence, without sincerity, without truth, call it what God calls it, using his name in vain. If you disobey or dishonor your parents, if you hold anger in your heart, if you covet what others have, if you look on others with lust, if you practice dishonesty or take what is not rightfully yours, agree with God that it is sin and make straight ways for straight paths for Jesus. How? Give him clear and ready access into your heart and life. Mm -hmm. In your heart then, clear the way of all obstacles that are in the way of Jesus' path. Clear the way of self-righteousness. Oh, I'm okay. 
Clear the way of complacency. Care about your spiritual condition before holy God. Clear the way of resistant unbelief. Clear the way of pride. I don't want to have to do that in order to be a Christian. Clear the way of your own thoughts about Jesus and see him as God's word declares him. As God, the son who came in the flesh to die for sin, who was raised from the dead and who sits at the right hand of God as Lord of all. Amen. Secondly, believe in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You need a spotless Lamb as a sacrifice for your sin. Not, not an animal, but a God-man. You need the blood to cover your sinful life so God can pass over your sins and forgive you. God says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. He provided the Lamb, the spotless Lamb, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So why would you ever look to the good that you do in your life and think that it's going to cover your sins? It will not. Why would you have sent Jesus to the cross if it would? You need the blood of the Lamb of God. And so I encourage you, if you've not done so already, and likely in this room there are some who have not done so already, I encourage you to look to Jesus in faith, to believe in him, to believe that he was the Son of God in the flesh, and that he was the Lamb of God who took away your sin. Because otherwise you have no hope. For no one and no thing can take away your sin. Thirdly, in the spirit of John the Baptist, let us as his church purpose to focus, atten focus attention on Jesus and not on ourselves. Let us not get preoccupied with anything else. Let us each, you, and by the way, these two years have been a challenge to that. Because we've had to think about other things that we've not had to think about before. How to meet safely and so forth. But let us not get preoccupied with things less than Jesus. Let us each use our gifts, follow our calling. And if it is public, as John's was, let us never allow people to become preoccupied with us. We're going to be here as a vapor for a little while. No, we serve one who is so much greater. Let's put people's attention on him. As his church, let us be faithful to keep heralding Jesus, who has come and who is coming again. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we pray that that would be so in the life of our church. We pray that we would learn ways that it is not so, so that we can be more faithful. And I pray especially for souls here who are not right with you because they have not trusted the Lamb of God, the Son of God. I pray that you would bring them to that place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our worship team will come now, and if the Lord lays it upon your heart concerning your need of personal salvation, concerning your need of a church home, and you want to speak about that or just pray about that this morning, come and greet me while we sing this final song. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's stand together. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, who in sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior.
what a Savior. Amen. Would you be seated for just a moment? And Richard and Linda Perrine, if you would come up here. These, some of us know these two very well uh, from the past great servants in this church for, for years. Come on over here behind the microphone. Yes, you have to do something public today. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, Pastor Matt and I had the joy of sitting with them this week. It is their desire to join again North Hartford Baptist Church by letter from Deep Creek, Deep, 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 Deep Creek, Creek Baptist, Baptist Church. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We'll help you out. Thank you. I appreciate that. You've been faithful members there for how many years? 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. I thought that's what you told me the other day. That's tremendous. And before that, as I said, they were faithful, many of you know in service here at North Hartford. I am delighted that they are back. Amen. They said it felt like coming home, but again, needed to be the Lord's will. They've discerned that it is, and I want you to hear them profess their testimony, as we do with anyone joining the church, and, and their understanding that this is the Lord's will. I do this with help, so if that scared you just for a minute, I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but here's the question that you need to a answer. Uh, do you believe that when Jesus died upon the cross, that he died for your sin, your personal sin against God. Absolutely. I do. Amen. And do you want to follow him as the Lord of your life for all of your life? Yeah, certainly. Amen. This is a part of it, isn't right. it? Right. Because they gave this some thought, and I'm glad they thought to come back. I, I really am. I'm very thankful. I love these two. Uh, appreciated them before. Appreciated them from a distance. Uh, just a short word. He went out. They moved so that he could care for his parents, and uh, that need is no longer there. Your parents have gone on to be with the Lord. I'm thankful that they've come back here. They have family in the area, so that was a calling card. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Grandchildren are important. So we will, just by show of hand, are you encouraged about this? It's not an official vote. We're going to do that uh, next, uh, next month at the business meeting. And we're not going to have a receiving line, but I do want to encourage you uh, after we pray, certainly individually come up to them if you'd like to and greet them or do that in the, in the coming weeks. Let's, let's stand and let's join together in prayer. Father, we do thank you. We, we thank you for what we've heard in the message in John chapter 1. Continue to bless us through this gospel, we pray. And I thank you for this decision made manifest through Richard and Linda today to rejoin with us. I pray that you would bless them through the fellowship, through the preaching, through the relationships, in, in every way, bless them through the church. And then, Father, make them a blessing to the church in the ways you design in the coming months and years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.